Good morning. Today's Daf Yomi is Masech Hasagiga Daf Chaf, and we are sponsored. Our Torah study today is sponsored by Yafa Shena Bracha Sachs in the whole week in memory of her father, Chaim Feigel, Ben Rebarl Shimon Vester, and also by our friend uh, Grace uh, Warren Bolton in memory of her of her brother, of her mother, and of her grandmother. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. And in memory of her brother, Bobby Thomas, her mother, Beverly Goldstein, and her grandmother, Grace Lubarsky Goldstein. So today's Dafiomi will start on the bottom of Yutes on the base, where it says, Amar, we have been discussing in our Mishnah and from the beginning of this, uh, from the previous mission, we were, ta- we were ta- talking about the different levels of holiness associated with food. There's chul and there's regular food, which is one level. Then there's mice or shani, and there's the sanctity involved with eating the secondary tithes, uh, then there, which can be eaten even by a regular Jew, but it's, it has to be eaten in Jerusalem. And there's a third level of holiness, which is truma, which is food that can only be eaten by a Kohen. And there's a fourth level of holiness, which, which is the food that's comes from the temple sacrifices, which is called kodshim. And then there's the fifth level, which is not food, but it's the level of spiritual purity and sanctity associated with the water that was sprinkled uh, from the red heifer to purify people. But from the wording of the Mishnah, Rav Mari draws a conclusion, two lines from the bottom on 19b. Rav Mari taught, that there were certain people who even though they were eating chulin, they treated their regular food as though it was kodesh. They treated all their food items in their home as though it was kodshim, and they were careful to eat it with the same level of meticulous care that they would eat their kodshim. So the person took that, that, that level of purity upon their household, then we're going to view uh, that food item as though it was kodshim. Um, and so therefore, uh, so therefore, it would require it would acquire the sanctity, so to speak, in terms of one's guarding of it. As we state, and what's the proof of this? Mimai, midolo katani bahu mala. From the fact, on top of twenty A, that uh, that the when the Mishnah lists that the garments of the Prussian, meaning the people who eat their chulin in a state of ritual purity, uh, that they that they don't say. Uh, are, are considered tame for those who eat their kul and betar that, that for the fact that the mission doesn't introduce this car- category that somebody's garments of somebody who eats just regular kul in, in a state of ritual purity is going to be considered tame for a person who eats kul as though it was kodesh. And we see from here that they are, that these people who eat kul in that those garments are treated just like kodesh itself. And so therefore, from the fact that the mission doesn't introduce this as an extra category. Gemara says, but why do you have to assume that conclusion? Maybe the only reason why, okay, yeah, it's true. The Gemara doesn't introduce it. The mission doesn't introduce it as a separate category, but maybe the Damu with Truma, Hatani Truma, the Damu Chulun, Hatani Chulun. But maybe it's really going to be actually like somebody who's Chulun, Shanas, Altar, Sakodesh. Maybe their garments are like Truma or like. Or like chulin, because we have other uh, other sources that compares this level of sanctity to chumor chulin. The Tanya, as we learned in a brisa, chulin shenasu al taros hakodesh arein kachulin. That if you have your chulin and you eat it and you and you conduct yourself as though it was taros hakodesh, it's still going to be considered like a chulin garment. And so therefore, chulin. So therefore, your garments, if they were touched by somebody who was kachim, you would be considered to be tamei. So, and that's, and Rabbi Lezer Tzedek says, that they're going to be considered like it's truma, which is also going to be tamay for somebody who guards himself on kachim. So, so we have other sources that, that list this person in these other categories. So why do we have to assume that it's like kachim? So that's not the proof for it. So the proof for the idea that chulon chanasol of taras hakodesh is like kachim, what Mari was saying, comes from the conclusion of the Mishnah, because misefa, what is he, because in the conclusion of the Mishnah, it says, Yosi ben Yoazer, Yosi ben Yoazer was one of the pious ones of the Kohanim. And he was pious amongst the Kohanim. So therefore, 
he always guarded himself to eat truma in a state of ritual purity. So he was always conducting himself in a state of ritual purity so he could eat truma. So his garments uh, were, were going to be considered midras la kodesh. So he didn't guard himself against kachim. He only guarded himself against truma. So his garments would be considered to be ritually impure for somebody for, for eating kachim. Whereas you have Yohanan and Gutgada, Yohal Taras Akodesh Kol Yama, Yohanan and Gadol would eat, he would eat his whole life as though it was Kachim, meaning to say he was literally in this category of Chulan Chenazo Al Taras Akodesh, but his garments will be considered Tamei for, for vis a vis the ashes of the red heifer, the water of the red heifer, which is the highest level of holiness. So we see from here what does that prove? Lechatas and Lakodesh Lo. So since he was Chulach and Asal Taras Kodesh, it was going to be considered to be richly impure for the, the Mechatas, for the water of the red heifer, but not for Kodesh, but not for Kachim. So we see from here the fundamental principle that Chulach and Asal Taras Kodesh is considered to be like Kodesh, is considered to be like Kachim. Just before we go on, I want to just pause, say like a little bit of drush, or just one moment of drush, that this whole idea of what we're saying, you know, you might think to yourself, okay, this is the most esoteric topic in the world. What does this have to do with my life? I live here, I'm in the 21st century. What does this have to do? We don't have these ritual purity laws any, anymore. It's, uh, we don't have Kachim. We don't, we don't really eat Truma. No Kohen eats Truma today. So what does it have to do with anything? But just pull out these words, just distill these words. Chulim, regular activity. Shenasu, which you conduct yourself. Al, tahara, sakodesh, on the basis as though it was holy, on the purity of holiness. Kikodesh damu. It becomes like kodshim. And so that teaches us that we have the ability to turn our everyday activity, chulim, to turn it by, by, by assuming that, by, by, by giving it the, the, the principle of kachim, by saying we're going to make it holy and it will become like it's holy today. So our chulim can become like holy, uh, holy. That's the basic takeaway message from this very esoteric teaching of the Daf Yomi. And you could really do this for every, uh, every piece we're going to see. You're going to see really powerful ideas. So for example, in the next piece, and the Gemara is going to give uh, three examples of a person who they lose concentration, what's called hesach hadas. They, their mind loses focus, they lose concentration. And because they lose this concentration, it's going to be considered that their level of watching uh, is not going to be considered sufficient. And therefore the item automatically becomes ritually impure. Even though we didn't see it become ritually impure, but because their level of watching was not sufficient, it became, we consider it ritually impure rabbinically. But from here also, we see a very, very important point that, that Life is about in, uh, about mindfulness and intentionality. And if a person doesn't provide mindfulness and intentionality, then it's going to be insufficient. So, so that that's 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 what the point is. You have to have mindfulness and intentionality. And so that's that's the basic uh, idea behind this next piece. So says Rabbi Yonasamana Lazar. So we're going to have three examples of where a person loses focus. Uh, and therefore his, his intentionality is not there, and so therefore it automatically becomes Tamei. So the first case is from Rabbi Yonas of Menel He says, not from afarto heimenu. Let's say his, uh, his, his, gar, his cloak, his, his scarf fell off of his head, and Amr Havero, and he says to his friend, Tanoi, pick it up and give it to me, please, I'm sure. And Asnoi, when his friend gave it to him, Tamei, it's going to be ritually impure. And Rashi says, even if his friend is Tahor, it's going to be considered like all of a sudden it's richly impure tamay. Why? Because as the Gemara is going to explain, we have a presumption that when your friend holds something, you're not going to be you're not going to be considered like you're watching it properly. So therefore, since his friend was holding it, he wasn't guarding it even for a moment, and that's going to be considered like it's hasach hadas. And second of all, the person who picked it up, we don't think he was watching it because he said, why is he asking me to pick it up? He, he, he knows that he doesn't know if I'm uh, richly pure or not. So therefore, he doesn't want me to watch it, so I don't need to watch it. So therefore, that case is going to be richly impure. Second case, Amr Bionas and Amram. Let's say a person goes into his closet, he says, I'm going to take out my Shabbos clothing, but instead he takes out his weekday clothing. Then we're going to, the love shine, and then he puts them on, we're going to say, Nitmu. Then we're going to say, these garments are Tamei. So why? Because there he didn't guard it properly. He thought he was guarding for one thing, he ended up guarding for, for the other thing. And then the third, uh, the Gemara's assumption is, be, because 
if you think you're watching something for one thing and you're watching it for the other, that's not a valid watching. You need to watch it for everything that you had in mind. And now we're up to the third category. The third example, uh, the third case that we're talking about is about Amr Abu Lazar Bar Tzadok. The Rebbe Lazar Bar Tzadok said the third example is Ma'isev Eshtein Hashem. There's an incident with two women, Chaveros, and they were both uh, careful about the ritual purity. That when they came out of the bath, uh, house, one of them took their friends, they switched their clothing accidentally. So, and they came before Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Akiva says they're Tamei. Rabbi Akiva says they're Tamei. Why? There too, the assumption is because you intended to take one garment, you took the other garment, so you weren't watching your garment for a little bit, so there is the breakdown in concentration. You can imagine the level of concentration you need to have at all times. We're talking about a society that's built upon mindfulness. Uh, my, I have an Apple Watch, and uh, for some reason at night, I also get a, a, an update. Take a moment for mindfulness. The whole Gemara is mindfulness. The whole Gemara is mindfulness. So don't interrupt my Gemara study with your update from the watch. You take, you say, take a moment for mindfulness. So now the Gemara challenges these three ideas. Ask for Rabbi Oshaya. Rabbi Oshaya says, I'm going to challenge this idea that, that, that is presented by these two Rabbi sons and one Rabbi Lazar. So, so what's the challenge? It says, also be other So if you're saying if you intend to take one thing and you take the other, then it's then it's ritually impure because you lost concentration. Well, what if you intend to put your hand in the basket to take a, a piece of wheat, uh, wheat kawa, and you end up taking a barley bread, that also should become tamen. And if you want to say, if you want to say also that's the case, but we know it's not the case because we have a source that says that that's not the case. But we have a source that states, let's say you're guarding the barrel and in this barrel is and you think it's wine. And then you discover it's oil. We say that it's actually ritually pure and cannot make something else. But there, you thought it was wine and it was oil. And we say it's not Tamei. So why in this case of the wheat and in the cases of Rabbi Yonasan and Rabbi Lazar do we say it is Tamei? So Gemara explains, Ema Seifa, but, what, but really the, the rest of it, it's Tahora from being Tamei, but it itself is a Surlecho. Uh, but it itself cannot be in. Why can't it be in? Because yeah, there's two levels of ritual impurity. There's one level where it can make something else Tamei, and that's that's the least level, but then there's an earlier level where it itself is, it itself is, there's one level is where it can make something else to me, that's a stronger level, but then there, it itself is is prohibited to eat. That's what's called a, a, um, a shlishi. So, so basically shlishi for truma and revi for kachim. So we're saying that that in the last case, it itself, even though it can't make something else to me, but it itself is prohibited to eat. So am I, why? So what's the scenario here that we're talking about? There you did guard it from something that was, by the way, we're now on a tangent from the idea because we're discussing this price of it. We're saying that in the case of the wine, you had guarded it from it itself becoming prohibited to eat, but you didn't guard it from something that would allow it to excuse me, you guarded it from something that would cause it to make other things to me, but you didn't guard it from it itself becoming prohibited to eat. So that's why we're saying it itself is prohibited, but it, but, but it cannot make something else to me. So that's the scenario there. And the Gemara says, is that really possible that you could do what's called a partial guarding? You guard it for one thing and not the other? Can you really guard something for just part of the way? The Gemara says, yeah, you can. It's no problem. In, yes, you can do it. But Tanya, we have a... We have a source that proves this. Let's say a person stuck his hand into the basket. And the basket's on his shoulder. And you have a shovel inside the basket. And you had in mind to guard the basket. But you didn't have in mind to guard, guard the shovel. Then we're going to say, uh, the, the basket is tahor, whereas the shovel is richly impure to me. Asal tahor, the basket is richly pure. But why ask the Gemara? It's mama grateful asal. Why don't we say the basket, the, the shovel should make the basket tamay by touching it? So they say, no, ain't kli, mitame kli. 
Uh, you know, we say the reason why that doesn't work is because one utensil as a general principle, you'll have to take the Talmud's word for it, that one utensil cannot make another utensil tummy. The Gemara still pushes and probes the matter further. So why doesn't it, it make what's, what the, the, the food items in the basket tummy? So Amar Avina, the reason why the food items in the basket don't become tummy is Omar shemartiv midavar shemetamo midamar aposo. It says, no, because you say, I watched it from something that it itself, um, uh, so he says, I watched it from, so from the protection that it can't make something else to me, but not from something that it itself become, became disqualified. And so therefore, well, you see that you can do what's called a palgo in a two So you can guard something for, for one thing and not for the other in terms of your intentionality. But nevertheless, we see this question that the question, going back to the, when we cited the source, the question is that we had said from the case of Rabbi Yonah's son, the two Rabbi Yonah's sons of Rabbi Lazar, that if you intend to watch it for one thing and the, the item got switched with something else, that it's ritually impure. But now we have this case that if you intend to watch it for wine and, and it ends up being oil, that it's tahor, that it's ritually pure. So it's contradiction. And so the Gemara says, we call Mokam Kasha, it's difficult. And furthermore, we're going to give you other examples of where these, these laws that were taught by Rabbi Onasan and Rabbi Lazar are contradicted, where you think you're watching one item and it's another item, it's considered to be a lack of intentionality. Because what about the case, what about the case of Moses Rabba Barafua? There was an incident about one woman, she came in front of Rabbi Ishmael. But Amr when she says to him, Rabbi, she says, my teacher, begged I, I was making this garment and I was in a state of ritual purity. But even though I knew I was basically ritually pure, I wasn't really paying so much close attention to it. I wasn't, I didn't have intentionality, but I know nothing happened to me. It's all good. It's all good. Don't worry about it, Rabbi. I'm sure it's fine. But then Rabbi Shimon was worried. Well, what do you do? When we talk he started asking her questions. And when he started asking her questions, she said, you know what, Rebbe? Actually, Nida, actually, this woman who was in Nida, this, this, uh, this uh, the woman who was in Nida is in her time of her month, and she's considered to be Tameh, ritually impure. Whatever she would touch would become Tameh. And so therefore, this Nida, she was actually helping me, and she pulled on the, on the, on the, the thing I was doing. On the, and, and guess what? So therefore, it did become Tameh. So it says Rebbe Yishmael, Ah, oh, we see from here, Kama Gadolam Divri Chachamim, Shayo Omer Bolibo Ashomro Tar, Aim Bolibo Ashomro Tamei. Say, look how look how smart the rabbis were. The rabbi said, if a person has intentionality to guard it, it's Tahor. It's ritually pure. Otherwise, if there's no intentionality, it's Tamei. Anyway, we see from here that if she had intentionality, it would have been uh, it would have been Tahor. And so, therefore, and so 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 we see from here that if she had intentionality, it'd be Tahor. Even, even if she thought she was watching one thing and would be watching something else. I mean, the Gemara assumes it's a question and it, it doesn't strike me as the greatest question, but that's what the Gemara says. And then the Gemara introduces another question. Shuv Maisabisha Achasim Rabbi Shemal has a lot of these women coming before him, another woman come, coming before him. And, and, and Amro said to him, Rabbi Mapazu or I have this, this cloth, this, this, this tablecloth or whatever, I, and I wove it in a state of ritual purity. But I didn't actually have intentionality. I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't say I'm intentionally guarding this from becoming ritually pure. I just know nothing happened. When we talk Padikos, but then he started asking her questions. And when he started asking her questions, guess what happened? Sure enough, lo and behold, the more he asked her questions, what did he discover? Rabbi, actually, name a nifsikali. Actually, while I was doing it, I was a Nita woman and a, a string broke. And then I tied it up with my mouth. And then I went to the mikvah to, and then I came back. And guess what? The spit was still there. So the whole garment will become tamay from the spit of the Nida woman. And says Rabbi That's exactly what the sages were telling you. You need intentionality. If you don't have intentionality, it's no good. And we see from here that if you have intentionality, if you watch, if you think you're watching one thing, you have believe with Shomro, it's okay, even if it will be wine and turns out to be oil. Anyway, so this is a question on the three cases we had above, because we had Rabbi Yonason A, who said, if you drop it uh, and your friend picks it up, it's no good. 
uh, and B, where you thought you're getting your Shabbos clothes and you got your weekday clothes, they're Tamei. And number three, where the two women switch their garments. Aren't these contradictions to those three cases? So the Gemara says, well, let's analyze them. Bishlomo Rebbe Lazar Ratzadik. It makes sense according to Rebbe Lazar Ratzadik. These are not a problem. These, 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 these cases don't contradict Rebbe Lazar Ratzadik. But what did he say again? He said that the two women switched their clothes when they came out of the bath. Why? Because Koachas Vachas Omeras Chaverti Chaverasi Eishas Am Aretz Umas Chaday Tamina. Because everyone, uh, those cases, the reason why it's Tame is because each one says, listen, I am careful, but my friend, she's married to an Ama Aretz who's not careful about the laws of ritual purity. And so therefore, and she still let her take it, so therefore they didn't have concentration at that. Most of the you know, because she's married to an Ama Aretz, she must have thought that she wasn't having intentionality uh, if she was going to allow her friend who's married to an Ama Aretz, who therefore probably touched, uh, touched her at some point, made her Tame too. And when Rabbi Yonas and Ben Amram Nami, and point to Rabbi Yonas and Ben Amram, we said that it's Tamei, if you stick your hand into your closet to get your Shabbos clothes, you take out your weekday clothes, it's no good. Given the Kalim the Shabbos, Avu Shimur Tfei, Masach Daitim, you know, when it comes to your Shabbos clothing, you're going to do a higher level of watching, so therefore you take out your weekday clothing, it shows that you didn't have the same level of intentionality in guarding it, that's why it's ritually impure. But what about the, the first case, that's Rabbi Yonas son Ben Elazar, what happened to Rabbi Yonas son Ben Elazar? According to him, he says that if you drop your, your, your scarf off your head and your friend picks it up, it's Tamei. Why? Why can't you watch your garment while your friend is holding it? The Mar says, yeah, because that's why. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. The reason why, why you can't, why it's Tamei in that circumstance is because because we have a presumption that when your friend is holding something, your intentionality does not extend to what your friend is, has in his possession. You can't have intentionality uh, to protect it, to guard it while it's in your friend's possession. The Mara says, hello, is that really accurate that you can't have intentionality to protect something that's in your friend's possession? That, you, that your level of uh, ability to guard it is over once your friend is doing it? There's a very deep idea there as well when it comes to responsibility of doing your friend responsibility for something. We're at the top of 20B. But Tanya, but we have the following principle in the Brisa. What about the following case? We have the following source. On 20B, Let's say you, have, uh, you hire these donkey drivers or your workers, and they are ame arts. They're not careful about the laws of ritual purity. And what they're doing is to unin taharas, but they have a pottery utensil which has ritually pure foods in it. Now, a pottery utensil, if you touch it from the outside of the utensil, everything inside it is tahor. But if you go over it, if you go over the airspace of it, then it's going to be uh, impure. And if you, so if you touch it inside of it, uh, it's going to be it's ritually impure. So if you give these ame arets to, uh, to carry your taharos, even though he's he's come as far as a mill, and mill usually we say three quarters of a mile from it, then Torah of Torah, it's still going to be okay, even though the Amearis are holding it. It's not ritually impure. But if you say, you go ahead, I'll follow you, then since then he's he's no longer sees them, then it's ritually impure. But but there. In the first case, it's going to be pure, even though his friends are, even though the Amiarits are holding it. So, so why? And we said, Maishna Reisha, Maishna Sefa. What's the difference between the first case here and the second case? Or in the first case, where the Amiarits are holding it, it's Tahor. In the second case, it's Tame, it's ritually impure. In the first case, he, before he hired these Amiarits, he stuck them in the mikvah. So, therefore, so therefore, they can't make the items tame, even if they would touch it. They, they purify. Well, the Gemara says, well, he say for Nami. Well, if whatever scenario we create for the first case has to be for the second case. So if he stuck them in the mikvah, why are they tame in the second case? So the Gemara says, well, in the second, in the second cause, uh, because the second cause, yeah, he stuck them in the mikvah, but when they came out, they touched their friends. And they said, uh, they, they, you know, they gave them a hug. Who knows what they did? So therefore, they became tame. Well, if that's the case, Yacharei Nami. So the first cause also. So Gemara says, yeah, well, in the first cause, Beboam Baderach HaKalton. The first cause, they, he could have shown up and spotted them at any moment. They didn't know where he was. He could have been right on top of them. But, so that's why we're going to say it's Tower because he stuck them in the mikvah. 
and and they could have showed up at any second. Therefore, it's the harm. But, <coughs> the principle, yeah, yeah. I want to come right back to that mayor. Mayor is pointing out something. I want to come back to it in a second. Let me just finish this thought. So therefore, therefore, it's considered a good protection, even though it's in the hands of his friend. But yeah, he say for Nami. Why in the latter cause do we not say that? That, so Mar says, no, because since he says, you go ahead, I'll follow after you, it shows that he doesn't have, he's not protecting, and they're also going to not feel like he can show up and watch him at any second. And so therefore, for that reason, that reason is not considered good watching. My dear friend Remeyer is with me, says this idea that, that, that it says the Balam Derecha Kalton, that he could come upon them suddenly, so it's considered to be like a good shmira, like a good protection. Remeyer says this is an ashkacha, we use this, um, um, that if you want to give ashkacha on food, that we have the problem, we, we have mashkiach, could be yotzev in nechnas. If the mashkiach, the person who's watching the people making the food, to come in at any moment and they don't know when he's going to come in. That's going to be considered like a good shmira, like a good guarding, except for meat, because by meat we have a principle of and that the meat, the meat, if it's if it's if it meat comes out of the watching of the Jew, then we don't know that it was that we then we have to be concerned that it could be have been switched or something. It loses its 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 guarding. But by non-meat items, you don't have to have a mashkiach there at all times. You just have to have the possibility that the owner knows that the mashkiach could come in at any second. It could be babala, babala and that would be considered like a good shmir. The mashkiach doesn't need to be there at all times. And anybody who says that is 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 not consistent with with uh, with Allah. Yes, Mayor. I mean, basically, uh, also, this works out with technology because uh, you have a video. Right. And you have, a, you have the CCTV on, in your factory. Because yeah, it can only be in, in, in a certain level of, of yeah. areas. But if you have a CCTV with the recorder and, 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 and the DVR so, in it, then you can actually uh, see a, a whole large space with a lot of different yeah. areas. It's and it's on. even stronger than, than the... My, in some instances, Mer stronger Mer than the person. Vermeer knows what he's talking about. Vermeer says here also, you know, when it comes to watching nowadays, you can use technology under certain circumstances, it'll be even better than any rabbi. Because first of all, technology, you can video and record it for everything for all eternity, as opposed to, as opposed to not. So, and you have witnesses. And you have witnesses. So it says the Gemara, the Hadronach in Dorshin. Hadronach in Dorshin. So uh, are you trying to say something, George? I was going to say, how does this apply to the kosh root of cheese and making cheese? Um, well, so that's a that's a question about the uh, cheese that whether the Jew is supposed to be there at all times. So that is a question about the level of shmira that's required for a Jew by the making of cheese is is uh, more intense. So I don't want to go into that and start answering that with speci specificity right now because I don't have those books in front of me. But when it comes to making of hard cheese, there is a higher level of uh, of ashkacha that's required. Yes, for sure. Thank you, George. Okay, so now we're, very good, very good point. So the Gemara says, uh, the next Mishnah, we start the next chapter, Chomer B'Kodesh Mi B'Truma. So the, um, the Chomer B'Kodesh, but by the way, one of the ways we can get out of that with, with George's point is if the cheese is owned by a Jew, it's a problem if the cheese is not owned by the Jew, but if the cheese that's being made is owned by the Jew, then you don't need as much a level of, of protection. So you could have a Jew's a partnership in it, maybe. So that's one of the uh, suggestions that's made sometimes. But anyway, Chomer be Kodesh be So now we're going to talk about different levels of, of, of stringencies. Uh, these, uh, we're going to compare Kachim and Truma. Truma is the food that you give as a tithe to the Kohen, get an in by the Kohen and his family. And the Kachim is the sacred food that comes out of the temple. Mar is going to give 10 stringencies that apply to Kachim over Truma. And we'll go through them quickly in the Mishnah, and the Gemara is going to explain them. Number one, that when you immerse something in the mikvah, every part of it needs to touch the water. But So can you immerse two utensils together at once. You can do this by kachim, but not by truma, but not by kachim, because there's a concern that the water, when you do it by kachim, the water is not going to get to everywhere. Number two, that there are different parts of the utensil, uh, and if it touches one, the other parts don't become tamay. That's by 
truma, but not by kachim. Number three, a nose is a midras, nose is a truma, that you can carry the truma in a pottery pot while you're carrying something that's tame from a zav, like, like, uh, like for example, the shoe of a zav, but not for kachim. Number four, big day ochle truma, midras akodesh. If somebody who's, who wants to eat kachim is carrying the garments of somebody who eats truma, it's going to be considered like he's tame. But big day ochle truma, the uh big deal chuma midras So somebody who's carrying uh somebody who's carrying the garments of truma, uh, then it's going to be ritually impure for kachin. Number five, woke me this hektesh me a truma. That when you immerse something that's for kachim, it's not the same, uh it's whole it's more intense than for truma. How so? That uh for Shabakodesh Matir Managev said for Kachim, you have to untie it and then dry it, and then immerse it. And then you tie it. But by Truma, kosher, but by Truma, you you for you can even leave it tied and then you immerse it. Number six, Kalama Nigmar and Bitahara, that if you have a utensil and then while you're finishing it off, it can't become tummy until it's finished. But while you're finishing it off, it becomes Ritual, uh, you, you complete in a state of ritual purity. Uh, for Kachim, you still need to immerse it first of a low truma, but not for truma. And uh, I don't know what number we're up to, but now if you have a utensil, you have different food items for Kachim. If one of them became Tame, then everything that's in your utensil is Tame of a low truma, but not for truma. And the next one is Kodesh Pasul, that something for Kachim, even if it's fourth degree tuma removed. It could become disqualified to be in Vashlishi Bachuma, but by Truma it's only third degree that it becomes disqualified. Uba Truma and Nitmes Achas Miyodav. By Truma, if one of his hands becomes Tame, then Chaver Tatar, the other hand could still become ritually pure, it can still maintain its purity. Whereas by Kachim, Mat Bil Shteyan. But by Kachim, you you have to immerse both hands at the same time. Shayad Metame is Chaverta, because one hand can make the, the other hand Tame automatically by Kachim of Loba Truma. And now, now the ninth one is Ochen Ochen Neguvim Biadayim Mesuavos Betruma Veloba Kodesh. That as a prerequisite to our food item being able to become Tame, it first has to have had liquid intentionally or or not intentionally, but that you wanted liquid to go on it. So let's say the food item never had liquid on it. So then you can eat it with Truma even with hands that are not that are not clean, uh, because the the food item does not become Tame. But that does not buy by Kachim. By Kachim, you still can't eat it with those hand items. That are not clean. And the last one is on the top of 21a, uh, Onain. Uh, Onain is somebody who has suffered a death and they're supposed to go to the mikvah before, uh, after they can't eat the kachim while they're an Onain. So then, Umachusar Kippurim, and somebody who still needs to bring a sacrifice, even though other than that, they've gone through all the levels of ritual purification that's required. Srikhan Tfila Kodesh, they have to immerse before eating kachim of the Lola Truma, not for Truma. The Gore is going to explain all of these categories. Gemara is going to explain all of these categories uh, in the coming days. Um, and I will encourage you to not give up, even though it seems very hard to review. It's just, these are not difficult concepts. It's just a new language. And if you apply to it, you will get it. I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors,